Uh, I will talk about uh, deep learning because that's what I've been working with the last few years. And uh, it's really what's behind uh, a lot of the applications that you've heard about and seen uh, that is presented as AI in the last years. I mean, there's some things that are not, but many of the impressive stuff is AI. For example, we have AlphaGo, we have art generated by AI that's been sold for quite a lot of money in Christie's. Um, we have code generated by AI. Here we have an example that uh, you tell the AI to create um, a, a button that looks like a watermelon. And it actually creates the code. It makes a modern watermelon. And it's not beautiful, but at least it's something. Um, and self-driving cars, of, of course. Um, the biggest challenge currently in in uh, creating self-driving cars is to make the cars understand what's happening before them uh, to see the world really. And to do that, deep learning has really been, been the essential part. So my talk is in three parts. Uh, I will start with talking what deep learning actually is. Uh, I will talk about the deep learning revolution uh, starting in 2012 and it's the reason that it's so hyped. And then I will just end with a few words on ethical concerns, because this is a powerful technology. With the great power comes great responsibility. Um, so what is the deep learning? It is a kind of machine learning. And what that is, uh, I will come back to in a second. But it's commonly applied to images, to text, or to speech. It can be applied in other areas as well. Uh, but these are the most common ones. Um, deep learning models uh, take days, they take weeks or months to train. It can go faster, but typically quite long, and you need specialized hardware to train it. And you need large amounts of data. Sometimes you can do with smaller amounts of data if you combine it with some other data sets that it's larger. So key question, what is machine learning? So I come from a mathematical background, so it's natural for me to compare it to mathematical modeling and statistics. For example, um, if we want to make a statistical model of how the COVID-19 pandemic has spread in Sweden, you have some parameters. You have, for example, a parameter of how large part of the population is infected now. Another parameter of how many people does one person on average infect. And a third parameter for, say, how many people are new. And you can combine all these parameters in a model that you try to guess how they relate to each other and relate to the output. Um, and you get some predictions and you get some understanding um, of this. Whereas in machine learning, uh, you only care about the predictions. You get an input and you have an output. And in between, you have a black box. Um, so this is data driven. Um, it's the fact that you can actually get an output. So it's only based on that you train the model that you give it some correct labels to start with. You have an input, and you know what output you should get. And uh, based on that, you can adjust the parameters uh, in a way with optimization um, to actually uh, get the model that do what you want, that give you the predictions uh, that you have. So the benefit of using statistic or, or statistics or mathematical modeling is that you can use lower amounts of data because you actually have some assumptions of how everything works. With in machine learning, you need more, more data, but you know, that, you know, on the other hand, you're a lot more flexible. So deep learning then, that's when you put something that's a bit like a brain inside the black box. And this artificial brain is called an artificial neural network. You do neural network training uh, to teach the brain something. So what does the brain really look like? Well, often like this. So think again that you have X coming from the left and Y coming out to the right. So you have your input X, you take it through the first layer and that's essentially you apply a function and then you go to the second layer. And there you apply another function based on the input and next layer, another function and so on. And you may have hundred layers. So basically applying a lot of functions in a row and then you may combine um, different layers if with each other in, in different special ways. Um, so with this model, you have uh, typically uh, a lot of parameters, a lot of flexibility. Maybe 
a million or even billions of parameters yeah. uh, that you need to optimize to get the correct ones. Is that a question? No? Oh, probably not. Um, so, uh, and so it, it required some uh, training techniques to get this right, and it also requires a lot of time and a lot of data to train. And the essential part uh, for it to work is really the data. Uh, this is a quote from Andrew Ng, uh, one of the biggest uh, and best influencers in the deep learning community. You should not miss his newsletter, The Batch, if you're interested in deep learning. Um, and he said, uh, data is food for AI. And the machine learning team, that's the chef. So with that, it means not only that data is essential for the machine learning to, to work at all, but also that the quality of data may be even more important uh, than the quality of the model. I mean, if you have a crappy chef, you will not get the good food. But if you have something decent, I mean, the, the, the quality of the ingredients is really the most essential part. Um, and he has done studies on that, that if the ML team focus on actually improving data quality, it gives a big, bigger payoff sometimes than, uh, than putting into a new state-of-the-art model, for example. So the deep learning revolu revolution then was, of course, uh, spurred by a big data set, and it's called ImageNet. And the ImageNet challenge was a challenge between research institutions and um, teams in industry. Um, to actually try to classify images into thousand categories. So you got one image uh, and your task was to say, is this a cat? Is this a strawberry? Is this a dog or a specific kind of dog, for example? Um, and the data set you had to train on um, and test on was uh, 14 million images. So a lot of images uh, scraped from the internet. And what happened in 2012 was that a deep neural network um, actually was the winner and not by small margin. It outperformed all the others with a very large margin. I think it was more than 10 percentage points in accuracy. And it represented an, a new technology and other people followed suit. And just three years later, uh, the performance had improved even more. Um, and you had, uh, the computer was actually better than humans at classifying those images. I put an image of a, a GPU here uh, because the neural network was trained on the GPU and that was a really important part because uh, GPU training speeds up uh, the process may, maybe by like a hundred times. So if you have a training time uh, that's already is, uh, weeks or, or days, a uh, hundred times speed up is really the difference between making it practical or making it non-practical at all. And I put, it's an NVIDIA GPU here because it's in deep learning, it's typically always NVIDIA GPUs that you train on. So I think, I mean, one of the main drivers really behind this revolution was uh, that you had GP, good GPU cards. So I think we should all thank all the people who played computer games and uh, paid for the development of GPU cards in the last uh, de decades. And the other people we should thank are all the people who uploaded cat pictures to internet, because without all those data to actually do these challenges, we would not have gotten uh, very far. But it was not only in the uh, image classification that deep learning uh, became state of the art quickly. Um, in speech recognition, it was used already in 2010 to create state-of-the-art models. Chinese handwriting, a year later, as I said, image classification, and we have biomolecular target prediction and medical image segmentation. So it was a, a wide area of applications um, where it became the best possible machine learning model. So it got a lot of attraction from research institutions and from industry. Um, so in the coming years, uh, many things happened. Um, and one of the most important things is the frameworks developed that made it a lot easier to program and, and create neural networks. In the beginning, it was really difficult uh, to, to program these GPUs. 
but then we came CAFE and in 2015, 16, 17, we had TensorFlow, Keras and PyTorch. Um, and Monai is a recent framework only from last year that's specialized on, uh, on image analysis, medical image analysis. So there are more uh, frameworks coming out uh, even now. And the other part that made it a lot more accessible is courses. There are lots of courses on deep learning and I listed them in my two favorite ones here, Fast.ai AI and Deep Learning AI. And I think the subtitle in Fast.ai AI really says a lot. I mean, make your neural nets uncool again. It's a, uh, it is not, you don't need a PhD in computer science or mathematics to, to train in neural network anymore, actually. But it helps, right? <laughs> Let's see. Oh, no, it jumped a lot. Okay. So there. Um, I mean, as I, as I started with, I mean, there's lots of uh, media attention in deep learning uh, um, achievements, and you've seen many of them. Um, I will list two that I really like. This first one, Seeing AI by Microsoft, I mean, actually enabling blind people to understand the world around them using an app. I mean, it can narrate and read aloud what's happening and what it's seeing around you, and it, or it can read a menu for you. I mean, so AI, it's just an example of how AI really can be helpful for um, people with disabilities. The other application I will talk about uh, is protein structure prediction. Um, because this has been an open problem, I think, for about 30 years. And what you want to do is that when you have a DNA string, it's quite easy to sequence and to understand what the DNA string is. But it's not understand, easy to understand what the, this DNA string actually does in practice in the cell. And to understand functionality, you need to understand structure. You need to understand the structure of the protein. And people tried to predict this from the amino acid sequence using uh, physics and how the molecules, mole, molecules interact with each other and models of that. And have tried for, as I said, almost 30 years until it was solved last year by deep learning, by DeepMind and Google. Uh, and I think this is, will be the first uh, Nobel Prize for deep learning eventually. We'll see. Um, so uh, as I said, I will uh, just end with a few um, uh, one slide on ethical concerns as well, because this is a powerful technology, so it can be misused. Uh, and one one case of obvious misuse um, is in the in China. Um, we have this company called Hikvision. It markets an an application that you take a picture of a person and it tells you whether that person is an Uyghur or not. And uh, this kind of technology has probably been instrumental in the problems that we've seen in the Xinjiang province um, the last time that we see now the last months or years uh, and media even talk about genocide. Uh, so deep learning has created problems already um, and it, it will create more uh, and closer to us. You and I think the biggest issue that's discussed in the community now is the issue of bias and specifically language model bias. And GPT-3, that's the model that I showed in the beginning that produced the watermelon button. It works the way that, in the way that you give it a few words and then it auto completes the sentence for you. And it says uh, on their own GitHub page, it says, GPT-3, like all large language models trained on internet corpora will generate prejudiced um, of stereotyped content. Um, the model has the propensity to retain and magnify biases it inherited from any parts of its training, from data sets we selected to the training techniques we chose. So because there are uh, lots of stereotypes on the internet, the output from such models will also contain stereotypes. So you see, I mean, if we give the three words to Muslims walk to this model, it crea creates the story when it says, into a cafe, they spot the jukebox, we should kill everyone here, says one to the other, and so on. And it has been shown by research that GPT-3 has a, a bias towards connecting Muslims uh, with violence. And you can easily think of other kinds of bias that's probably available on the internet. Maybe like women are not good at mathematics, for example. Um, that if you use such an algorithm for 
a hiring process, for example, that hiring process will really enforce the stereotypes that you have from before. And that could be problematic. And lots of people are looking into this. Uh, I think it will not only be solved by technology, but also by regulation. So with that, uh, that's enforced to the point that what you put into the model is really important. I mean, the data is the food. Um, if you have unstructured data, you have to be really careful for, for what you get out. Um, and with that, I say thank you.